welcome to um, the Infrastructure Committee. Uh, we have a quorum. We have, um, at present, we have two members attending via Starleaf, so um, Ms. Anderson and Ms. Kimmins. Um, <coughs> we've got... Um, any apologies at the stage? Jeez, okay. So just to remind members that the committee will suspend for half an hour at around 10.45, um, just to allow members to mark armistice day. Um, we have the <coughs> briefing sessions first and we'll deal with correspondence and other matters after the suspension as we need to vacate the room for 12pm. For Today we will receive a briefing from uh, Right Bus and Rise Hydrogen, uh, Northern Ireland Hydrogen Ambitions. We have also a briefing from the Ministerial Advisory Panel on Infrastructure and we have also some subordinate legislation to, to look at. We move directly then to our briefing from Right Bus and Rise Hydrogen. Um, at page 5 you will find your briefing paper. Um, Hansard will record the meeting. Um, and as I've said, the witnesses are attending by Starleaf. So we'll welcome um, Mr. Joe Bamford, the chairman of <coughs> Bus and Rise Hydrogen, and Buddha Adwal, the chief executive of Right Bus and Rise Hydrogen. Gentlemen, you're both very welcome to committee. Um, obviously, we'd hoped at this stage to have had a visit to, to Right Bus, but due to the pandemic, that hasn't been possible, but hopefully that will happen in the very near future. Um, so if you'd like to make your presentation, um, members will then follow up with some questions. today because one of the things that we've been pushing here in Northern Ireland um, is um, a hydrogen hub. Um, now, uh, there are two zero emission solutions for the future. There's batteries and there is hydrogen. Batteries probably work on smaller stuff. Hydrogen works on bigger and heavier. Um, hydrogen is uh, predicted to be a two and a half trillion market by 2050 and have 30 million jobs worldwide. Um, why hydrogen over batteries for Northern Ireland? Well, one, you have a battery, but you have a, a bus company that makes a hydrogen bus. We also make a bus too, but we make a hydrogen bus. Um, and two, um, when it comes to batteries, China has 73% market share worldwide. I, they've done a very, very good job at batteries. Um, and they also have a lot of the chemistry that makes batteries in their own supply chain. Whereas Northern Ireland has a lot of wind and a lot of water, and they predominantly are the things that make hydrogen. Now, when it comes to hydrogen, on-rise hydrogen, we have been looking at hydrogen now for, well, I've been looking at it for 15 years, but for the last three years in great detail. It's not expensive. We can deliver hydrogen in certain locations for the same cost as running uh, the bus on diesel. What is expensive at this point in time is the bus. A bus is twice as expensive as a diesel bus, but so is a battery bus. And here really are the fundamentally the main differences. We make a battery double-decker bus. That will do 60% um, of the distance of a diesel bus um, at best and take four and a half hours to charge up. That's all battery buses, incidentally. Um, and a hydrogen bus, our first generation hydrogen bus, does 95% um, uh, of the distance of a diesel bus and takes seven minutes to fill up and is 100% zero emission. So fundamentally, um, we are applying um, to the Northern Irish government 
um, we're not asking actually for um, a grant. We're, we're asking for a loan under something called, a, I think it's called FTC, uh, which is a commercial loan, um, and uh, to put two hydrogen hubs in Northern Ireland. Why a hydrogen hub? Well, look, if you want to be part of the hydrogen economy, you're going to have to um, uh, make hydrogen, and there is no hydrogen made on the island of Ireland. So the first step is to make some hydrogen, and then the other step, I suppose, is to get other um, um, products in the supply chain of hydrogen uh, to uh, invest in Northern Ireland. Um, so those are the things that I think with a hydrogen hub. One of the other things that I would you know, dearly like, uh, if you can help at all as a committee, the uh, British government have announced 4,000 zero emission buses. They announced it in February. Um, they have been slightly lost in this COVID thing, I understand that, uh, but they haven't really pushed those 4,000 zero emission buses, even though they keep announcing it. And if we could put some pressure on um, in any way possible to get this happening, and if half of those were hydrogen buses, you'd have the largest hydrogen uh, economy uh, in the world. So, look, if you get hydrogen going in your economy, my other point is uh, you would then start trying to drive that through the universities. You've got Ulster University and Queen's University, very good engineering universities. Um, so if you can get hydrogen going in one area of the economy, then you need to sort of supply the jobs and bring people through uh, your economy to do that. Um, so that's part of the hydrogen hub would be how do we you know, train up the people in Northern Ireland uh, to go forth uh, you know, on this on this global adventure to get two and a half thousand, you know, two and a half trillion market and, and see if Northern Ireland could grab some of that, that big market. Um, Bruta, I suppose there's some things, would you like to introduce yourself and say what you're doing as well, if possible? Yeah, no problem. Um, I think I've met some of the, the members on the committee and uh, so my name is obviously Bruta Atwal, um, CEO of um, Rightbus and Hut Rise Hydrogen and the reason for the the dual role is Joe and I believe that there is a you know, a common kind of um, approach to this. We, you can't have gas without the hydrogen, without the bus, and vice versa. Um, we we, as Joe quite rightly says, we've developed the bus business back to a a a normal business in one year. It's just gone out. It's just turned our anniversary at the end of last month, and within that year. Even with the shock waves of COVID, we've 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 stabilised the business and put a a development plan forward, which um, next year will look to spend 5.6 million pound in engineering costs to to invest in both in hydrogen and battery electric. But that whole operation will be stunted without the the availability of gas especially with our closest customer who we have a, a year and a half left off our, of our of our agreement purchasing agreement um, translink and also in the south uh, sorry in the Republic of Ireland um, for um, the NTA who who have ordered three buses offers have indicated uh, a, a requirement of up to at least 20 to to trial but their restriction is also um, the availability of gas. So by, by putting forward this request for a, a full um, um, loan of the FTC fund for a hydrogen hub, it gives the advantage, as Joe absolutely rightly says, which is it, it allows us to sell buses, both to Translink, the NTA, and further afield. But more importantly, it also develops a... A, a hydrogen culture within Northern Ireland, and Joe Joe says so. Joe said that the the level of investment, if you look at Germany, France, the UK, Portugal, Europe Europe wide, I think it's up to about ninety six billion pounds worth of investment over the over the coming five years. Northern Ireland would be a very well placed to start attracting both technically. Um, some of those opportunities and also having the skill base and the knowledge um, that can attract some companies. And I'll just give you an example of this because Joe put me in touch with a company. I won't give you their names because it's early conversations. But they've contacted me and said, 
they're a refuge truck manufacturer. They've been in, they've had inquiries in the UK, and would we help them and maybe even manufacture some of their refuge trucks for them? And those types of inquiries are are, are have started to increase. Um, and Joe and I have been approached a number of times and we've explained we have the factory space. We would ha happily use some of that factory space to encourage further uh, operations. If there is a hydrogen hub, which w we call an enterprise zone, that would absolutely attract these types of businesses. But without hydrogen of, of volume on the, on the island of Ireland, you know, it really, really does restrict our opportunity and, and future opportunities for the region. Can I just make two further points? We've been pushing a hydrogen hub for 12 months in Northern Ireland. Um, in that meantime, Germany has said that they're going to spend 9 billion on hydrogen, France 12, and the European Union up to uh, half a trillion over the next 10 years. Um, in GB, there are six other hydrogen hubs that are starting to get going. And, you know, it would be a shame if we had to go somewhere else because we couldn't get it going in Northern Ireland because Northern Ireland is perfectly situated for this. It's got wind, it's got water, it's got great universities who have got the right skill sets. Um, but if we don't get somewhere in the next six or eight weeks, you know, we have to start looking at all these other places that are chasing us to go and put jobs in their market. And secondly, um, on the 4,000 zero emission buses that the government have announced, you know, if half of those were hydrogen, you know, when Wright Bus, we've got 500 employees now in Wright Bus, but when Wright Bus uh, was doing 1,000 buses a year, that had over 1,000 employees. Now, if Wright Bus somehow managed to get a number of those and you could get 1,000 or 2,000 of those hydrogen, uh, uh, those zero emission buses, um, we could add a lot more jobs in Northern Ireland. So whatever pressure could, could be laid upon uh, the, the government in GB to help on that front would be fantastic. And whatever pressure could be laid on the government in Dublin um, would be fantastic too. Uh, we're, we're doing our business business to try and sell these things, but... Um, Sure, there's a political angle here to it, and that's your your sphere. And you guys are, um, uh, or you um, politicians, your politicians, and we're business people. And you know, you operate in the world of politics, and so whatever help you can give, we would be delighted to do more here in Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you very much, um, uh, Joe and Buddha. Um, Obviously, um, as, as a committee, we're very much engaged in the issue of decarbonisation of transport. <coughs> And certainly numerous questions that have been asked um, in the chamber across a number of departments because this is clearly a very much a cross-departmental um, commitment and obviously um, a project that which would need buy-in obviously from economy infrastructure and finance I am curious you have said that this is, these are conversations that you've had over the last 12 months uh, I know a number of members will have been involved in those conversations and I'm assuming that you have had those discussions with um, ministers. Could I ask you for an update on um, the engagement that you've had and whether it has been positive? Yes, look, um, we have had uh, positive uh, engagements. Uh, we've, we've spoken to um, uh, Minister Dodds and um, um, we've also spoken to uh, Minister Mallon. But, you know, um, there's been a lot of uh, words, um, but action is now needed, and that really hasn't, you know, been forthcoming. And I'm saying at this point in time, you know, we would be delighted to invest more in Northern Ireland. We'd be delighted to borrow some money to to, to get this going. Um, but I think we kind of need action um, in the next six or eight weeks. Otherwise, these other places, you know. Aberdeen at the moment are pursuing us very heavily. Tees Valley are pursuing us very heavily. These are all different people who are who would like hydrogen in their economies. Now, we made a commitment a year ago to coming to Northern Ireland. And we feel very responsible for the people in our business and we would like to do more there and build that up as a, um, as a hydrogen hub. Um, but I, I think action would be helpful um, if possible. Okay, we just, just with regards... Rude. Joe, if I can, if I can add, um, we've had meetings with um, the finance minister uh, Murphy, uh, the transport and infrastructure minister um, uh, Mallon, 
and uh, obviously the economy minister Diane Dodds, who who have all visited. Uh, sorry, and Diane actually, uh, so Minister Dodds has actually visited our site as well. And I think everybody understands the need. Everybody has expressed um, positive um, um, sentiment to say it is important for a hydrogen hub in, in Northern Ireland. They all understand the, 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 the jobs benefit and they all understand that what we're asking will, will encourage more investment in, 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 in the territory. I think in the, in the middle of a COVID crisis, We've we've adjusted our request because we were requesting direct government funding to support this. We've we've adjusted it because we appreciate that there is going to there are going to be demands on the government purse. So we've we've moved it to um, a, a loan from the FTC fund, which kind of complements our investment in Right Bus, which is many millions, as everybody knows. So we can can as a commercial operation to deliver a hydrogen hub as well, which at, com you know, at commercial rates over, over a, a, the terms of the FTC fund. So having listened to us and uh, us listening to them, we've put in a very commercial bid now, and that, that will be hitting their tables um, very soon in a report that we're doing. And we'd love the, this committee to support We'll obviously give a co copy of that report to this committee, and we would appreciate the support of the committee to, to further, hopefully, to develop the hydrogen facilities in Northern Ireland so we can encourage jobs and other industries into the region. OK, so just to be clear, at this stage you haven't actually submitted your, your bid, but that's a work in progress? We've, we've submitted an initial report which um, talked about hydrogen and the hydrogen hub, and we are now kind of modifying that report just to make it easier for um, for for the FTC fund to be given to be awarded as a loan rather than a a, a government um, a government um, um, a subsidy. Okay, you, you have said that your business will be restricted without the availability of gas. Um, what then is the potential um, impact then on jobs if you have re sort of remodelled your business then around hydrogen? Historically, our two largest customers have been TransLink and NTA. And without hydrogen on the island of Ireland, either north or south, which currently there is very little hydrogen on the island of Ireland, then the opportunity to sell hydrogen buses is, 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 is very, very limited, which obviously has a direct impact on jobs. Okay, um, I have just two other questions. Um, just in relation to the, the sites which you have identified for the hubs, could you maybe give us an indication of where they may be? Hmm. Yes, there's two sites uh, for the hub. Um, one is in Belfast Harbour, um, and the reason why is because you know, the difficulty with hydrogen is you've got to marry up supply and demand. Um, the one in Belfast Harbour is next to a big TransLink bus depot, so therefore it would be very easy to get it to um, TransLink. But also, when it comes to harbours, one of the next products, probably around 2024, 2025, are hydrogen ferries. Uh, the first six or seven of them are being built at the moment in Norway. So we also think that that would be perfectly positioned for Holland and Wolf and and the sort of harbour sort of type stuff, um, so having hydrogen production in uh, but in there would be great. And the second hub is in Balamina. Why in Balamina? Because well, a we have a factory there, but also around our factory there's a lot of empty factory space. So if you were talking a hydrogen hub. Um, that would be a great place to try and incentivise, and I think it's more for you, the government, to do, is to incentivise other people in the supply chain. Um, so whether that's, you know, businesses making hydrogen refuelling stations, businesses making hydrogen vans or hydrogen rubbish trucks or, or any other parts of the, sort of the, the economy, I would be trying to drive those into that. So having a hydrogen hub and a central place that they can, you know, use hydrogen for, that would be great. And then you would try, I suppose, to get the local universities and, and um, the local job force to, to start being trained around those hubs um, so that they could go into those businesses if you could incentivize them to come into your, um, into your territory. Now, we have had conversations with the harbour and East Antrim um, 
County Council and both both complement some of the activities they're doing. If recently Antrim announced some um, investment around um, uh, around Balamina that is um, hydrogen and green energy related, and also the harbour are obviously actively looking to redevelop um, uh, around that around that area. You've you partially answered my last question, which was in relation to the broader decarbonisation of transport, looking at ferries and haulage companies and so on as well. And I appreciate in the, 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 um, in the document that you sent us, you referenced a hydrogen academy. I was just wondering how all of those things will then link together and what broader discussions that you have had in order to make this a reality. So, look, um, uh, the way hydrogen works is, is this. Over the next 10 years, there's various different products that will potentially be on the market. Today, buses are ready, um, and to get hydrogen working, you've got to marry up supply and demand. So you look at which products are coming on the market when, and then you've got to look at what the, um, what the demand is for hydrogen around that. So buses are ready today. Uh, like I said, hydrogen trains probably start coming in 2022, hydrogen ferries around 2025. You know, rubbish trucks are sort of some of the things that the people are talking about. Um, hydrogen trucks start becoming coming in more about 2026, 2027. If I if I if I'm correct, I, I've spoken to most of the different um, product groups and understood where their engineering processes are and and when they think they're going to start becoming commercialised. Look. I, at the moment, the only thing that we can be in control of is what we have in our portfolio, which is a hydrogen business and a bus business. Uh, you, you see, the thing with hydrogen is you've got to start somewhere. You can't do it all at once. And if you start with the bus and uh, with a hydrogen hub, then, you know, I suppose it's... Uh, for one, I will help you find other people in the supply chain and drive them into Northern Ireland because it would be great for us to do that. Um, but also, I think that's where the, the government and, and, and you know some of the other uh, supply chains need to be sort of driven in and I get the university as well to, to, to talk to them about how they're going to supply you know, um, people for the jobs and train people up. There's a whole program here. It's not just this one thing. Can I... Can I just add to that, that, I mean, we're fortunate to, you know, the, the, you know, Joe and his family own, uh, you know, a separate business. And we've been talking to them about hydrogen over the, the, the last few months. And what we're finding is our engineers are, are very advanced and they, um, and they are leading the way and taking that, the other company forward. The other thing is, with regards to our commercial negotiations, we have got some very good deals, again, which are, which are helping. Design-wise, we're far more advanced, and therefore, we are helping. And therefore, you know, Northern Ireland is a very, very good position with our, with our universities, with, with Rightbus, with our knowledge, to really take advantage of the hydrogen economy. And as I said, we have been approached by a number of companies already Talking about some collaborations, talking about you know how we how they come from further afield into the region, but without hydrogen, all these are just words because it's very difficult for us as right bus to to run our operation. We are being currently charged a phenomenal amount of money for just to fill our buses up to test them for hydrogen, which is not the commercial rate right now. You know, really, it should be a quarter of what we're paying. And it all because there is no commercial hydrogen on the island of Ireland. And it is becoming a real bottleneck, both for our conversations, our future um, plans, but more importantly, the day-to-day -day, um, operation of, of Rightbus. Okay, thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Okay, thank you, Joe and Buda. Thank you for, I was going to say coming along, but you haven't came along, but you're still here in presence anyway. <laughs> Just regarding the, the site you referred to, um, whether it be in Belfast Harbour or Ballymena, what would that site look like? No, I don't mean physically, but the process. If you give me a quick rundown on the physics or chemistry of the production of hydrogen, a quick layman's term of that, what would that look like, either those sites for you know staff, many employees would be inquired of that, and I'll let you with that for now. So very simply, um, the way 
we are proposing to make hydrogen is something called electrolysis. Um, and let's keep it quite simple. Uh, water is H2O, um, which means basically you've got uh, two H dots, which are hydrogen, and one O dot, which is oxygen. And you have a, um, a membrane, um, we call it electrolysis. You put electricity into the membrane, you hit it with water, it splits the water into the hydrogen and the oxygen, um, and then we put the hydrogen into the bus. The bus is basically an electric vehicle. In fact, it's the same drive line as a battery bus, but instead of lugging around three and a half tons of batteries, you're taking a gas around, and what happens in there is you have this hydrogen battery, a hydrogen fuel cell, um, now, invented in, uh, in Wales in 1842, so it's not new technology. And what happens in the fuel cell is this. You have another membrane. The H dot hits one side. The O dot hits the other side. And as they recombine, they create a lot of electricity, which drives the vehicle, and uh, water comes out the exhaust. What does it look like? Um, well, it looks like some shipping containers stuck in some boxes um, uh, inside a shed um, on, on a production site. Um, so I mean, that's what it looks like. The site itself c contains three main elements. One is a transformer, which brings the electricity in. One is the second part is a, an electrolyzer, which does the chemical reaction Joe's talking about. The third phase is a compressor, which compresses a gas ready for, for shipping into the, the relevant location. Um, it's, it's covered by a, a rudimentary shed. Normally, we paint it in the, in the colours of the local area to, to merge them in. They are single level. They're not very high. Um, they are they're slightly more broader than they are high, but don't really occupy too much space. Um, you know, you would probably f the locations that we've seen are more than adequate for for the produ production of hydrogen, both for you know the, potentially for the Translink um, site if we were to fortunately get that get that order, or the the, the Balamina site. And are many bit of many that site, for example, the Balfour site, many would that employ. We're talking about if you look at through the construction phase, through the uh, operation and distribution. You know, you're talking to over 100 people just for for that phase, but the the uh, uh, per site. But then the additional benefit would be, as Joe quite rightly says, currently we're we're selling approximately 400 buses within Right Bus. You know, in its heyday, it did over a thousand, uh, 1,500 a, a year. You, you'd see the the doubling and trebling of the workforce at Right Bus as well. So, in all in all, you talk about you know over a thousand. To 2,000 jobs in, in the industry, and not including further investments in places like the universities or or secondary and tertiary um, suppliers coming to support that process, and then other vehicle manufacturers, stroke organisations wanting to use their resource, technical knowledge, and infrastructure around Northern Ireland. So let's just put it simply. Um, there's a case for getting started. Now, getting started means, you know, 100, 200, 300 jobs. And, you know, again, if if we got up to 1,000, 2,000 buses a year in right bus, we'd add a lot more jobs. But the European Union predict that this is going to be 30 million jobs in the hydrogen industry by 2050, and it's going to be a 2.5 trillion market. You have to start somewhere, and this is the perfect place and the best place to start with buses, with, you know, you've got Translink, uh, which is a customer. Um, we've got Belfast Harbour. Um, you've got uh, our hydrogen business. You've also got our um, uh, bus manufacturing business. You've got the supply and demand um, tied up there, and that, that would be a great place to start. And then you have to go and backfill up and down the supply chain to get those into your economy, uh, and then you can export them around the world. It's exactly what China did with batteries 10 years ago, and the reason why they have 73% market share of batteries work with globally is they just they did this. They got it going in the home market. They got a, uh, the volume up in the home market. Therefore, they got the lowest cost base of this, and once you've got the lowest cost base of this, you can export it around the world. One of the job opportunities that I think people kind of fail to realise is that are the design development jobs that would come out of this, you know, and they are high quality, high value jobs um, because 
you know, we are fortunate in Northern Ireland. We are leading the way with hydrogen technology. Belfast University and Ulster University are doing some great work, not just in developing engineers, but simulations of bus routes, etc. You know, Wrights have got a history of doing um, engineering work around hydrogen, and now that is probably leading the way. And you can see people coming in, probably to our detriment at Rybus, probably. They'll probably pinch some of, poach some of our people. But that, that intellectual economy is not just um, high value, but high worth as well. So do you, do you see the uh, final question, just because you've answered a lot of points there, the, the TransLink buses that's currently there, what way are they, their hydrogen, where is it coming from currently? Currently, it's coming from Energia, but the capacity for that is only for around six buses for the trial. They are active. We've had a number of meetings with TransLink to talk about, you know, how we can support them as a bus manufacturer and, and work with them to see how we can um, produce gas. There is a tender happening currently, and we are um, uh, obviously uh, applying for that tender to provide gas. But you know, what we're trying to do is put a tender in from our current sources, which are in from are in England. But, you know, obviously that economically, it will be a lot better to do that from from Northern Ireland. OK, thank you. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Anderson. Martina? Nope. We'll move on to Andrew here. Cheers. Thank you very much, Chair, and to Claire, was previously an employee of TransLink. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. A lot of the questions I had have already been adequately covered. Just, just two things, um, and I'd be very supportive of what the proposed investment is. I think it's something that we need to be ahead of the curve here in Northern Ireland, and we need to be able to support uh, the new technologies that you're outlining. Uh, you're asking for um, FTC. Um, I just wanted to know why it's FTC rather than commercial borrowings. And the other one was be what any impact, potential impact of Brexit would be uh, upon your operations. So, look, um, <laughs> this is the difficulty uh, with politics. Um, we know that there's a need for a hub. Um, the FTC is a commercial borrowing fund. Uh, we've tried to um, put it to government to get some sort of funding on this hub um, and ultimately FTC probably seems the easiest route. Uh, if, if you can tell me a, a better route, I'm very, very happy to listen. The thing about it is, you know, there's probably eight weeks, ten weeks before the money comes. So all these other governments and all these other areas have announced a lot of money for this to go in. They haven't actually put the money up yet. But they will do it probably in January, February, March. That's where Germany and, and all of their sort of hydrogen plans come to fruition. So we kind of need to get on with it quite quickly. And FTC is the one that uh, apparently is, is the route to do it. How do we see Brexit? Um, look, my friend, Brexit is, uh, it is, it's a political thing, and it's up for you guys. We as business, we have to operate within whatever environments they are and try and find our way through it, and it will cause some complications, it, or it might not do. It depends on what deal you guys do, and then we have to figure out how that applies to us as a business. Um, so I, at the moment, I, I, I know that sounds like I'm ducky it, but I, I don't really know what the deal's going to be like, and that's why therefore I can't really tell you um, how it's going to affect us. Booty, you probably know a little bit better because you understand yeah. better than me. I mean, already, you know, it is costing us money because we have to look at um, different tra um, import export duties. It, it potentially can limit our operations to the EU. But again, until a deal is done and we know the details, then it's very difficult, as Joe absolutely rightly says, to to estimate the you know, what, what the benefits, stroke, um, uh, problems that um, Brexit is going to cause. But we, we have to prepare and we've already started incurring costs to prepare. Coming back to YFTC, um, Joe has invested quite a lot of money into Rightbus already and to get a commercial loan on the, on the um, electrolyzer stroke, the hub, uh, we'd need to put some money onto that side as well. We, we're going to the FTC because we want the whole amount because we want 
the, the Northern Ireland government to understand the total level of investment we're putting into into the region. And, you know, we could stop, or we could reduce the growth of right bus by investing into a hub, or we could inv in, invest it into a right bus. We need more than we are putting in. The best route is, is the FTC fund for the whole amount. We will take that as a commercial operation, run it, and drive it efficiently forward to grow hydrogen within the territory, which will grow um, right bus with the level of investment we're putting into right bus, and as I say, have further benefits for the rest of the economy. I suppose the thing I would just also say is, you know, commercial lending doesn't lend very well to new pieces of kit. So it's difficult to get a commercial lending on an electrolyzer at this point in time because there's no secondary market. So, you know, if you go and finance a car, um, the recourse to that finance is with the bank. Um, but actually, a bank doesn't want recourse today on an electrolyzer because there isn't a secondary market. As soon as you get this going, by the way, there then becomes a secondary market. So the other part of the jobs bit is, you know what, um, uh, you know, developing the financing around um, uh, the hydro economy as well is going to be a huge benefit. Um, and, you know, companies like Bank of Ulster, which, you know, we've been dealing with them, my family have been dealing with them, Bank of Ulster since 1974. They do all our JCB finance with us. Um, so, you know, those are the sort of people who could actually figure out how to finance these things going forward. But you have to start somewhere, and this is why a government loan um, in this scenario um, makes absolute sense. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for your presentation. I'm sorry, um, sorry to be a bit late, but I've read the presentation itself presented to us. Uh, Joe, not, not everybody has a ca uh, cabinet behind them like that there. I like, like to look at some of the vehicles in that cabinet behind you. Um, just a couple of points, and I mean, I've been up to Great Bus in the past, and we've seen the great work they've done. I remember the uh, some of the buses they've done for the for the American market way back in the day, and I mean, they've they employed a lot of people, and I wish you success in the new venture. But I just want to talk about um, where we're at. We're very keen, obviously, a lot of the members of the committee in terms of a new way forward and greener technology, and I mean, hydrogen hydrogen certainly is something we would support. But just a wee bit of uh, detail on the level of demand for both hydrogen and electric vehicles. How has that grown over the years? <coughs> and um, which has seen most demand of, of two, just in those questions, yeah. Okay, um, so electric vehicles at this point in time um, are uh, technology um, at the moment is perhaps a little bit more advanced than hydrogen. But um, as we move forward, Part of the problem with big and heavy stuff is it doesn't work very well with batteries. So let's put it in kind of an extreme circumstance. If you wanted to do a Boeing 747 with batteries, you'd need 2,700 tons of batteries, i.e. it would never get off the ground. So the bigger and heavier you go with batteries, the more problematic it becomes. Um, and so this is why buses are kind of interesting for hydrogen, because like I said earlier, a battery bus does 60% of the distance of a diesel bus, um, whereas a hydrogen does pretty much the same as a diesel bus and operates in the same sort of manner. So um, batteries are starting now. Um, they're, easier to live, they're easier to start battery vehicles easier because you can go and plug a few of them in. Actually, batteries don't really work at scale very well. So when you start looking at, okay, how do I do all the cars in Britain? Okay, well, you need three times the world's lithium, uh, the yearly lithium output to do all the cars in the UK, and you need to triple the grid over the next 30 years uh, or spend 300 billion on it. You see, the problem with batteries is as you do start growing, your grid becomes the issue. Whereas with hydrogen, it operates basically the same as oil and gas does today. You know, you can make it, I mean, you could make it at a wind farm on the, on the coast, stick it in a truck and drive, it and drive it into a filling station and fill it up. You know, oil is made and petrol is made at a refinery, stuck on a truck and goes to fill up. Hydrogen kind of doesn't 
work very well you don't do when you do sort of twos or threes but when you do a whole fleet 200 300 buses at a time and plan it you can make it cost the same and, and, and get there um with uh, with the same cost as well and operate in the same manner which ultimately we want to do because fundamentally the most difficult thing to change is human behavior and my view on it is very simple when you get something to cost the same and it does the same and it's as easy to fill up as the incumbent then i think you get mass adoption and just in terms of the, the overall market, I mean, where are we in, in terms of percentages, in terms of lactic and hydrogen versus the rest? I mean, clear, uh, clearly, we all, clearly we all want to move away from fossil fuel use, so just have you just looked into that? Or? So, um, look, battery buses, uh, there were, say, 500 done in the UK uh, in the last uh, two years, and there's maybe been 60 or 70 hydrogen buses. But as we've been pushing this over the last six to nine months, and as all these sort of stories have come out from Germany and everything else, our inquiries are massively going up for batteries, uh, for, sorry, for hydrogen. And the reason why is this. If you're a bus operator and you have a plan to decarbonize all your fleet over the next 10 years, and um, you know a battery bus will only do 60% of the distance, that means there's 40% of your fleet that can't be done by battery buses, or you need 40% more. Uh, fleet. Now, um, that's why I think hydrogen is going to be a large part of the market, uh, because uh, there's forty percent of the market that can't be done by batteries. Okay, just and I'll tell you the, the two last questions I have to get. And I mean, it's really around the two technologies: the fuel costs and infrastructure, and all of that. Um, just the difference in the costs, and and also we touch a wee bit on on the the fuel tank, the mileage, and all of, all of that. The the things, the challenges we'll face trying to roll all of this out in terms of being part of the market. And, and Peter, feel free to jump in if you want to, want to respond as well. Okay. So fuel cost at the moment, um, it depends on where we are, but we can make the fuel costs uh, a similar price to running the bus on diesel, um, depending on how close you are to the production facility. Um, the bit that isn't the same price at the moment is the bus. A battery bus and a diesel uh, and a hydrogen bus are twice as expensive as the diesel bus. However, we've done an exercise which is if you gave us a singular manufacturer, 3,000 hydrogen buses, at the end of that um, 3,000 buses, we think you could get to cost the same as a diesel bus. So, you know, a bit of volume and you get the cost down. Uh, that's less than 10% of the UK fleet, for instance. Um, Buta, you probably have stuff to add on this, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, let us be clear. You know, we as Wright Bus are investing in both battery technology and hydrogen technology because <laughs> we're a business that um, looks after customers first and foremost. But we were speaking to one customer very recently and we were talking about how hydrogen would work for them. And they, they came to the conclusion very quickly that batteries can't do what hydrogen can do, and hydrogen can do what diesel can do, and therefore why would you have electric buses? Why not just hydrogen? And the only the reason why you wouldn't have hydrogen is because of the supply of gas not being readily available and the cost. The cost only comes down with volume, and by instigating... Um, kind of by producing gas and having an opportunity for gas and seeing um, uh, gas available, um, the volume will increase and therefore the price will drop accordingly. We've, we've modelled this and we believe with volume of over 2,000 buses a year in the market, the, 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 there's price parity um, close to diesel very quickly. We've spoken to our suppliers, we've spoken to the industry as well, and we believe that that um, reduction in costs is, is very viable. But uh, as I said, what it needs is a, a supply of gas that encourages that volume. And if, by the way, if we continue uh, with batteries, you know, while we there's a market for batteries today, going forward five, six, seven years out from now, uh, we won't be in business because China has the cost base for batteries, they have the supply chain for batteries, and longer term, um, you know, uh, we won't be able to compete with Chinese uh, battery buses. And just, just quickly to clarify the point in terms of, say in terms of the imp any actual infrastructure, I know you talked earlier, uh, you answered the question earlier about Belfast and Ballymena, see any actual 
infrastructure that you'd need, and also the turnaround times in terms of the hydrogen and the electric batteries to turn those vehicles around and get them back on the road, please. Yeah. So uh, infrastructure is the same kind of for batteries and hydrogen. You have to plan them probably 18 months out. Uh, we have a planning department in, uh, and, uh, and a construction department because you have to figure out, if, you, if it's charging stations, you have to figure out, I can get enough power into that depot, how's it coming in? You have to go through a planning process. So it is 18 months out um, and the same with hydrogen. And the thing about hydrogen, of course, in this scenario is you have to think a little bit further, which is, you know, I need a production facility for hydrogen. Probably it takes us 18 months to build a, a hydrogen production facility and I'd be looking at to put a hydrogen filling station into a depot probably 12 months depending on how long the planning takes and all that sort of jazz. Uh, and, and to put the same charging infrastructure into a, a bus depot is probably 12 to 18 months and you also have to figure out how to upgrade the grid and get the grid power station in uh, etc. I think that's to me, that is one of the key points that Joe's just made, that the time for the infrastructure, whether it's battery or hydrogen, takes over a year. So that is a limiting factor for the growth of Wrightbus because you almost have to wait a year before the market is ready for your product. So the longer we wait to make these decisions, the more we constrain the growth of Wrightbus. And what are the costs? Sorry? What about costs? Costs of the infrastructure? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But depend, it depends on which infrastructure you're doing, but they're roughly similar. The battery infrastructure or, or hydrogen infrastructure are roughly similar costs. And it, it depends on, you know, your grid connection, the, the grid availability, you know, location of the hydrogen to, you know, the customer. But all in all, as Joe quite rightly says, the cost of either... Is, is, is you know are very similar. What we need to do is look what's best for Northern Ireland, and Northern Ireland has got abundance of wind and and water. It's got great um, communications to the, its key cities, and hydrogen can work very very well within Northern Ireland and um, and the Republic of Ireland as well. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Thank you. Beggs. Hello, thanks for your presentation. I hadn't realised just how fast hydrogen fuel cells um, were developing. Uh, I noticed uh, just this month, Hyundai has signed a deal to sell 4,000 fuel cell trucks to China, following on from 16,000 to Switzerland. So this is definitely a growing area. Um, the hydrogen hub seems to be... Um, simply a hydrogen production facility? Is that the key aspect of it? What will it cost and how many uh, trucks or buses would it be capable of powering? So um, we're talking about two hubs potentially. Um, they're roughly about 20 million quid each. Uh, they do about 200 buses each. So the first step, is, both of them are production facilities to make hydrogen and then you've got to sort of drive the rest of the economy around it. Look, Hyundai and Toyota both believe that hydrogen is the future of motive uh, and not necessarily batteries. I know they're doing batteries, but they've been pushing um, uh, hydrogen for, for quite some time. Um, and these are part of the economies. And these are, countries, these are companies that actually get this right a lot of the time. In fact, China has stopped subsidizing batteries at the beginning of this year and started subsidizing hydrogen to get it going in their home, home com um, economy. And what you've just seen from uh, Hyundai uh, selling loads of trucks to China is China starting to get uh, the volume up in its home domestic market. Therefore, it can get the cost down. And whoever gets the cost down and gets it to cost the same as diesel and operate in a similar manner will have them the massive export uh, opportunities that this um, um, this this you know economy can do. Um, so yes, I mean you are right. Hyundai and Toyota are leaders in this, um, and wouldn't it be great if Wright Bus could export our buses around the world because uh, we have a hydrogen economy in our home market and we've got lots of people trained up through the universities and through the schools that we can, you know, um, they can go around the world and, and, and drive uh, this business and, and drive jobs in the local economy. I mean, just put a, a commercial aspect to that. Japan has decided hydrogen is its, its um, 
um, fuel of choice above battery electric. And Wright Bus have sold their first five buses, um, touring buses, to to Japan just recently. Now, they, they are currently diesel, but you can quite quickly see um, those being hydrogen buses and being the basis to export, you know, further than, you know, the mainland in England and, and Scotland the world, but further afield to mainland Europe, to, you know, burgeoning economies as well. So, you know, we are in a great position right now because we are ahead of the curve at Wright Bus with our technology and with our design and development team, you know, who are punching above their weight, to be fair, because of their skill and expertise. But we can quite lose, quite quickly lose that um, advantage because there is, there is and there has been a lot of investment recently in, in not just European countries, but in Japan, in Korea, and in China, more worryingly, which will not only hurt us in the future, but, you know, potentially affect our, our growth as a business. Would I be right in saying, unless there is a um, hydrogen production facility on, on the island of Ireland, that uh, the cost of importing hydrogen is very prohibitive, certainly in the growing phase, and because it's such a, it's a volatile gas and, and uh, the cost of, of transporting it. So I think it can't go on ferries. How, how does it get here at present? I mean, not because of its volatility. I mean, it's a safe gas to travel, and there are very, very clear safety measures around it. But certainly, the transport of of a gas, you know, if it travels a mile, it's a lot cheaper than if it's travelling 400 miles and over a ferry. And that cost makes it, um, for the short term, viable, but for the long term, it, it is uneconomic. And you want the sources close to... Um, the usage as possible and uh, you know that's why the hydrogen hub is so vital for us yeah i mean i suppose i'll just add to that um look, we have our noses slightly ahead by six or eight weeks at this point in time from these other economies but as soon as they start putting and real money going into those things uh and have uh, and they have hydrogen already being produced in those countries, if we don't get it done in in, in Northern Ireland fairly quickly, um, you know, it has it, you it, will have to go. We, you have to go elsewhere. We have to go where the market is, and and it would be delightful to have it in Ireland and Northern Ireland, but also in Southern Ireland because you know, Europe's going to be a main market for us, and it's very easy to then go down. Hopefully, you know, if you get the right political decision, uh, hopefully you allow us to go down across the border and access the European market rather wonderfully and, and we can sell buses around the world. At the moment, we also have, you know, inquiries on hydrogen buses from Australia and New Zealand, Chile. Um, you know, there's, there's ones going into Madrid. They're not ours yet, but that's what we would like to do. Um, and we would like to be um, exporting around the world. Just one final point from me is by having hydrogen, we are also helping people with the planning of hydrogen infrastructure and having a bus. You know, we change our DNA from a bus provider to a solutions provider, which that adds real value into, into our sales pitch. And therefore, you know, we can do more and... Um, um, attract more custom that way by only selling buses then we're competing in a very very savage market which you know the Chinese or whoever you know with battery buses are trying to undercut the market you know quite substantially. A final question are you linked then with with Queens who have a history of engine design etc so that uh, or research absolutely. and absolutely absolutely so um hmm. Bamford Bus has, has sponsored Queen's. Also, JCB have recently uh, have started that process as well and are investing in Queen's. We have got um, engineers there that not only help us with the design of the bus, but the modelling of routes and how hydrogen or a battery electric bus would suit a route and, and, you know, and more, basically. And not only not only um, Belfast, Queen's Belfast University, but also Ulster. You know, I think the universities in Northern Ireland are 
are excellent engineering um, universities and also well equipped to support the, the growing hydrogen economy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hilditch, Deputy Chair. Thanks, thanks, Chair. And that was a question about Queen's there. <laughs> really just get in before me. So, uh, obviously, previously in the employment and learning, there was a there was a unit there sponsored by Rate Bus, I think it was, in relation to uh, design and research and engineering going forward. Uh, That's transferred to Bamford Bus. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then further from that, then you, you, you mentioned in the construction and the getting up and running there, maybe 100, 200, 300 jobs, or a bit sort of around that figure. Uh, the supply chain then, have you, have you actually pinned down just any details on the supply chain and what's available in Northern Ireland? Well, yeah, go, go so, so um, really what we're saying is, you know, if you get the volume up in your home market, then you drive the supply chain to come and uh, put their factories around your factory. So at the moment, there isn't a huge supply chain for hydrogen specifically in the local uh, Northern Ireland market. There's great students at the universities, there's great people, and, and that's what you could do. You've got great financial institutions. But actually, the supply chain in hydrogen is probably five or six units, you know, whether that's a fuel cell, whether that's hydrogen tanks. Um, these things are still quite nascent. The, the biggest fuel cell manufacturers in the world are in, um, are in Canada, funny enough. Um, but, you know, if there was a big enough market in their home market, they would probably come here as well. But that's what you would be trying to do, I would imagine, as politicians, trying to incentivize those people to come into the market. You know, you look at the other things that are made in Northern Ireland, you know, from the Terex crushers and screeners, but well, crushers and screeners won't be able to work on batteries. They're just, the batteries are going to have to be too big. So ultimately, those are things that will go for hydrogen. And, and if you can get a number of those things going on hydrogen, then why wouldn't you try and drive the supply chain to come and invest in Northern Ireland too? It's on the border of, the, of, of, of Great Britain and Europe. I mean, perfectly situated, great universities, um, loads of wind, loads of water. Uh, this is this is this is the opportunity for Northern Ireland to, to grab hold of at this point in time. So you, weren't, you weren't able to put any figure on it in relation to the bid that the, for the loan as such. You weren't able to describe how that would look then, particularly. So we're putting in that bid uh, this week for the FTC loan, but it's up to forty million pounds. If you want two sites, we will do that and, and, and borrow that off you, um, and um, and then drive that into the local economy. Um, I, I, I would urge you at the same time to have your own plans on what are the other parts of the hydrogen supply chain do you want in Northern Ireland. I'm very happy to introduce you to all of those and for you to try and drive those into the economy because if you get it going in one area, then yes, you should drive up and down the supply chain in your economy um, to get as much of that in your own place. Um, that's what first mover advantage is. And it's what China did on batteries, and now they have like, globally 73% market share on batteries. I mean, they own most of the supply chain, they own most of the chemistry. Um, they, are, they have a fairly unassailable, unassailable lead when it comes to batteries, at the moment, no one has claimed that on hydrogen. Um, it is going to be a large part of the economy. If nothing else, the wall of money from Europe that's going to go into it over the next 10 years, then yes, you should be trying to drive that into your own economy and it's going to go. Um, and whoever, whoever takes advantage of it, then you want to drive as much of it, um, as many jobs in your local economy. And let's be honest, manufacturing is... Uh, well, I rather love manufacturing. I've grown up in it. But, um, you know, it's normally the mainstay of a sort of tertiary town. It's not normally in capital cities. And it's normally that mainstay in that town. It'll be there for a long period of time. And when it goes, like what happened with Wright Bus and when it went, the town will die. Um, so, actually, the great thing about it is you get this going in hydrogen and off we go. The market's going to grow. Well, let's, a very simple example. There are two manufacturers of hydrogen refueling stations in the world today. But Europe are going to put in half a million of these over the next seven years. Uh, those guys don't have the capacity. Well, why couldn't you design one in Queen's University and put it into a factory in Northern Ireland? You could do. Those are things that are, you know, are waiting to be grabbed hold of. Um, now, I'm trying to do my little part of it, but 
you know, there are our own entrepreneurial people in Northern Ireland who want to be part of that supply chain, and, and, and that's what I'd be trying to drive if I was a government. Okay, thank you. So, uh, just uh, a vulgar question, sir, but I'll finish with this one at this stage, and over tight for time. Uh, playing devil's advocate, and you've been very upfront with us t today. If the bid was not successful, uh, what would that look like for Right Bus moving forward, Amford Bus moving forward? What what would be the future without the hydrogen development? Well, look, uh, playing without hydrogen development, you know, we would struggle on. I mean, we're going to make a battery bus. That would be great. But you know, China uh, is doing more battery buses than any other bus, uh, any other country in the world, and they're starting to now export them around the world. Again, they started on this China this battery um, scenario ten years ago, and they've got the lowest cost base. Now we have a, a window uh, for the next three, four, five years to, to do battery buses. But ultimately, when it comes down to a battery, we, do, we will never have and never be able to get the cost base for that to go. So there will be a problem on that. And on the hydrogen side of it, look, if we don't do hydrogen in Northern Ireland, uh, you know, I'm a businessman. I have to go where the market um, is, okay? And, you know, uh, uh, you know, I don't really want to go and live in Germany personally, but that's those are people who are going to start really massively investing in it, and that's ultimately where you have to go. Um, so, what are the consequences to right bus? Well, you know, we we'll still have right bus, but you know, you have to go where the market is. Um, and I don't want that to sound like, it, but I just have to be very practical about it. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry. Yep. No, I, I think the key. Really I think the key point is, you know, why not hydrogen? It's the best technical solution. It is very similar to diesel with regards to its pers with its operation. You know, it, it, it is zero emission. Northern Ireland has natural resources that produce hydrogen very easily. You know, the cost is very similar to battery electric, and technologically, we're ahead of the curve. So, you know, the, the, it isn't the case where you know why you know why should we do it why shouldn't we do it it's the only answer we can see on a technological reason that that replaces diesel quickly easily and practically and i'll give you an example on that a depot has a a person on a night shift who cleans cleans a bus fuels a bus gets it ready for uh, its operation during the day a battery electric bus would mean that person would have to change shifts probably to a day shift because the charging has to go across the whole day. Whereas hydrogen will mean that person can still work on a night shift, probably go home, take the kids, to the children to school, go, sleep, pick the children up and then go back to work. That type of human emotion, you know, is very easily forgotten. But as we all know, the bus industry is... is it comes out of a very kind of unionized and, you know, um, set ways. And to change all that would be very, very difficult. Well, why would you want to change it? It works and hydrogen allows it to, to continue to work as well. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Sanderson? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's up on with my signal for, for a part of the day. So thank you. And uh, and it captured most of the presentation. And, and uh, Joan, but I really do appreciate uh, hearing how you've outlined all of this. I'm quite conscious that you are very aware of the wind and water opportunity, potentially for the island of Ireland. And I live in the city in Derry. And literally, we live cheek by jowl uh, by Donegal. And obviously, I'm conscious, uh, as you have already highlighted, what the EU intends to do going forward with a half a trillion that they're going to invest in it. But you said about access to the island of Ireland in terms of the south of Ireland, um, and obviously the protocol gives you that. Um, and, and hopefully, as we move forward, there'll be no damage done to that. You mentioned the skills capacity and improving R&D. And I was glad to hear it was picked up by one of the colleagues about working with the other universities, because as you would know, the University of Ulster has got the schools of engineering, and I'm conscious of being in Derry, the link between Derry and Donegal, McGee University, uh, the Institute, Letterkenny Institute, 
work in a very collaborative way. So I just present that to you as an opportunity when you are building the capacity and just to ascertain if you've looked at the Northwest and if you have talked to, for instance, um, McGee as a university campus of the University of Ulster and if you've had any um, conversations with McGee in, about their relationship with Letterkenny because of the fact that they have the School of Engineers uh, incorporated into their, their portfolio. Uh, we would be delighted if you would like to introduce us around to all of those people and come into to the area. Um, you know, uh, look, I think this is going to give you lots of jobs in Northern Ireland, spread across Northern Ireland, and actually also, you know, there is a wonderful inter-Ireland um, thing. Now, uh, Northern Ireland, uh, you know, bear in mind, Booter and I come in recently in, you know, you're, it's, it's very political, can I just say. It's quite a political place. Uh, but actually, if you think about it, it's north-south. Um, uh, this north-south thing, um, you know, it would be great to have a north-south um, thing. You've got a minister down south um, uh, who's minister of transport, who's green. So, yes, that would be great to, 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 to drive those two things. Um, and also you've got access to a European market and some way of merging those two. You know, I, I leave you up to the politicians, but uh, you know, I'd like free trade between um, north and south, and that would be great if we could do that. So, look, we would be delighted to come and see um, uh, uh, maybe your, your particular area and um, work our way through it. And yes, in time, could have another hydrogen hub there. That's not a problem. Um, you know. Okay, well, look, con consider consider that job done. Uh, I definitely yeah. would make that would make that con uh, connectivity for yourself and uh, and for for Buddha to link in with uh, McGee here in Derry. And I suppose picking up on that because it's about looking at creating the opportunity for clusters of companies because you talked about that both in your presentation and in the material that you sent to us and it's to see the kind of or to understand from your perspective if there is enough uh, connectivity and synergy going on between the department for infrastructure and the department of economy just to ensure that the centers of excellence for hydrogen buses or hydrogen if uh, if that has been taken forward in the way that you feel will advance the opportunities uh, to create the clusters of companies, or do you feel that more needs to be done? And that's where we can come in effectively as a committee. So, like I said earlier, there's there's a couple of things that could be gone on. I'm not going to step into the world of politics between the two different things. Okay, I'm just going to say there isn't a lot of time uh, before money goes to other uh, these other plans, whether that's Tees Valley or Germany or anything else, or Aberdeen. When their money starts hitting, that's when all these companies will be owing to those areas because it's, it's real, it needs government money to get it going. A bit like wind did uh, a number of years ago, there's only so much that people can do putting a um, hand in their pocket. I'm saying to you that there's an opportunity for Northern Ireland, you're perfectly positioned at this point in time. But it needs to happen fairly rapidly, otherwise the opportunity goes. And, and that's not a threat, that's just the reality of where it is at this point in time. The other opportunity, that, if you were going to put pressure on, is this. The British government have announced 4,000 zero emission buses in February. They've announced it every month, but there's no money for it yet at this point in time. Okay, I know everyone's lost in the world of COVID, but if you put that pressure on, now if half of those were hydrogen buses, we could make those in Northern Ireland. That's 2,000 hydrogen buses over the next four years. Okay, I would add probably another two or 300 jobs very quickly um, to meet, the, meet that demand. So that is something from a government point of view, you know, uh, whether that's first minister, deputy minister, that's your world of politics. Whoever could put that pressure on, um, we would be delighted to uh, make as many of those buses in Northern Ireland as we could. So if you could help on that, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Well, Joe, I, just listening to you and, and reading the material you sent on, you're not being political, you're being practical. 
and the synergy that takes place in the executive is the you know because you have five parties working together uh, and when that does work together that's where you can find that opportunity so don't feel that you're setting it you're putting your foot into some kind of political territory that can be challenged and obviously there's a difference in the constitutional question but that's not what you're engaging in today you're being very practical and you know flagging up opportunities so let us see what we can do both individually and collectively to help that along thank you thank you Okay, thank you, um, Joe and Buddha. Um, that was that was a very interesting presentation, um, and certainly um, it's given us um, quite a lot of food for thought. Um, and certainly, um, we'll follow up with um, some of the requests that you have that you've made this morning, and and hopefully we'll get the opportunity to meet you in the not too distant future. Thank you all very much for your time today, and um, we look forward to doing more in Northern Ireland. Um, and we'll be delighted to do more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Bye. Thanks. Um, Okay, members, um, we are considerably over our time. We would finish that slot by the quarter past ten. So we've all, we've had to move um, the um, the advisory panel to twenty past eleven um, after our break. So if we can try to get through um, the admin side of this quite quickly um, in order to allow the last end of the session for that. Sorry, Chair, just to finish, I, I have a nephew who works for Outbus, so uh, just wanted to have that noted. If members are content just in relation to um, what we've just heard, if we write to the three ministers and the associated committees um, in relation to what we heard this morning, and yeah. if yeah. members are content yeah. to do that, okay, thank you. Moving then to. Chair, sure, just on that, it would be nice at the, at the earliest possible opportunity to get a visit. Yeah, we'll, and once we're we'll try and do that. Uh, yeah. um, members, I'm, we're really stuck for time, so we've got yeah, five yeah. minutes to try to get through some of this. Okay, so if we move then to minutes of page 133, it's for the minutes of the 4th of November. Members content? Agreed. Matters arising at page 142, um, again for the 4th of November meeting. Do you have any issues arising from that meeting? Nothing coming out of that, thank you. Moving then to correspondence, um, page 155, um, obviously at one, page 160 we have the departmental response to committee <coughs> correspondence and a number of issues from the committee meeting on the 21st of October. Members, any comments in relation to that? Chair, just on the taxi stuff, on the, on the ones that, um, the, the application process opened Friday the 13th for, for a two week period. And then it's going to take two or three weeks for verification. Then it's going to take a month for any any payments to be out. So I mean, what's new there? It's a standard. It's, it's going to be a, no, but I mean that you're, you're in the Christmas. You're in the Christmas that period. Yeah. So, but chair, I think it should be reminded that this is an additional payment. You know, and it's primarily I think a thousand pound to cover some costs of PPE and others. So it's not the only payment. I think people sure, I don't think it's an additional payment. There's, there's loads of people who hasn't got any money yet. I know, and there's people who haven't got any money yet from the grants for the executive no, no, three no, weeks no. ago. Not to speak over each other. Yes, no. I mean, that, but that, but it's not an additional payment, sure. It is. It's, it's, it's for seven months we've been fighting for taxi payments for to get a payment. I don't understand the If this starts on Friday the 13th for two weeks, but does then three weeks, it does over six, nearly a six week period during the Christmas. That's all. So I mean, I think just in mind for the timing of all yeah, of this. Yeah, absolutely. But, but obviously these things do take time too. So I suppose just Seven unfortunate, months. unfortunate, unfortunate that we're Sorry, Chair. Unfortunately, we can't write blank checks out to people. It has to be verification and uh, accountability. And I think um, at the first checks that were announced over three or four weeks ago for the grants uh, under the current COVID restrictions are only being issued in the last few days. Okay, so members content then. Chair, okay. chair. Sorry, uh, can I come in here? Chair, I, I also think that we need to be conscious of the fact that the criteria for application. Um, I've had about four taxi drivers just from yesterday evening, from that was announced, coming to me to say that the criteria for application may need to be at least flexible insofar as some of those taxi drivers changed the insurance that they had to try to get some kind of work during the time. They were taxi drivers. They had a couple of weeks then that they moved um, away from having taxi insurance, then went back to have taxi insurance. And they're concerned that they may not be captured as a consequence of changing that insurance because the criteria sets out the 
that you have to have a taxi insurance. So it's just to be taken account of the human stories that some of these people um, have had to obviously deal with the, rea- the reality that they didn't have work and there was no financial assistance put in place for them. So I just raise that with you because I am concerned as this rolls out, we will get more lobbying coming to us, rightly so, from taxi drivers who may once again fall out of the um, the opportunity to fail of the scheme that has been put in place. Okay, are members content that we flag that up with the department as a potential mm-hmm. issue? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Muir. Just a separate issue really in relation to the letter that came from the police in relation to the SNAP legislation and it said about the time scales around that. I don't know whether we've done it already, but if we could write to the department to ask for an update in relation to where that's being progressed. I think we did get a response. Yeah, we did Sorry. get a response we last week. We did get a response last week right. in relation to okay. that. So Okay, members content then to um, deal with correspondence as agreed in the memo. Um, subordinate legislation, we have three um, SL1s, the parking place to disabled persons vehicles, amendment number two, order Northern Ireland 2020, um, parking places to disabled persons vehicles, amendment number three, order Northern Ireland 2020, and the parking place to disabled persons vehicles, amendment number four, order Northern Ireland 2020. So these three proposals are in relation to authorised parking places within on, with unlimited waiting for disabled persons vehicles. In the consultation for each of the proposals, some objections were received and the department has on occasion, on a number of occasions, um, removed proposals for particular parking bays. The SL1s are at pages 175, 178 and 181. The proposals are not subject to assembly proceedings or members content with the proposals for the statutory rules. Good. Thank you. And the next one is the SL1, the Railways Amendment, EU Exit Northern Ireland Regulation 2020, at page 185. This rule is subject to negative resolution procedure in the Assembly, but is required to address failures of retained EU law to operate effectively, in particular under paragraph 3 of Schedule 2, European Control Act 2018, arising from the withdrawal of the United Kingdom from the EU. There are two aspects of the rule to amend regulation in order to implement single safety certificates and has been similarly omitted in GB regulations by SI 2026, and also to amend regulations to change references to specific regulations to reflect the updated regulation numbers and remove references to previous regulations. As proposed regulations are, result, are related to EU exit and are of purely technical nature, no public consultation was undertaken. Are members content with the proposals? Great. Great. Chair, Chair can, I, can I just say... Um, it's not that I want to do anything that's going to stop the direction of travel, um, as the members are agreeing there. But I just want to flag out, let's flag up that I'm a little bit concerned that we're obviously being presented with these SL1s and we're being told, hopefully rightly so, that these are only technical changes. Um, and I just want to be satisfied that in all of these SL1s that relate to the EU and us being dragged out, that there's no denigration of the protections that are being put in place. And I raise this because, Chair, I simply just don't know. It may be ignorant on my part, but I just would like that myself and maybe other members of the committee to be satisfied that we don't get something coming back to us at a later stage and we discover that there has been a diminution of some kind of protections. Okay. Oh, you've got to do that. Um, no Ms Kelly? No, no, I'm fine. And, okay, if members are content with the statutory rule, and we flag again that up with the department in relation to the, their interpretation of what a technical issue is. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Members content. We will adjourn until twenty past. Thank you. Okay. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Okay, members. Well, welcome back to our session and um, moving on to our next briefing. Unfortunately, we we are quite a bit behind. We're now having the briefing from the Ministerial Advisory Panel on Infrastructure. Um, the briefing is from page nine of your packs. Hansard will be recording. Um, all the witnesses are attending by Starleaf. 
And can I welcome Kirsty McManus, Director of Institute of Directors, Jenny Green, Director of Civil Engineer, Institute of Civil Engineers, Craig McGuigan, uh, Chief Executive of Northern Ireland Environment Link, and Richard Johnson, the Associate Director of the University of Ulster University Economic Policy Centre. You're all very welcome to the meeting this morning. Can I apologise profusely um, that we did run so late and we kept you waiting um, at the earlier part of the meeting? Um, You'll appreciate that we are under time pressures today, um, just given the nature of the day. Um, and also we have to leave this room by, by 12 o'clock as well. So, um, but thank you for um, your presentation. Um, and if I can ask Kirsty maybe to make some opening remarks and um, we'll follow up with some questions. <coughs> Hello. Kirsty? No sign. Can anyone hear us? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. If you'd like to maybe make some opening remarks and then we'll follow up with questions. Thank you. We be a very right, did not we? Got sure. Sure. There. Chair, thank you for the opportunity to present to the Infrastructure Committee this morning. If I may introduce my other independent colleagues who have joined me this morning, we have Jenny Green, Director of the Institute of Civil Engineers, Craig McGookian, Chief Executive, Northern, Northern Ireland Environment Link, and Richard Johnson, Deputy Director at Ulster University Economic Policy Centre. Well, as we all move into the recovery phase of COVID-19 pandemic, infrastructure will have a key role to play in terms of boosting Northern Ireland's long-term competitiveness, raising standards of living and societal well-being. It will support the vision for our society and economy as we strive to build back better and emerge from this very difficult period. The challenges that, pre -existed, that existed pre-pandemic will no doubt be exacerbated by the COVID restrictions which makes investing in all of our futures even more important than before. For that reason, the Institute of Civil Engineers back in June called for the formation of an independent body for infrastructure in Northern Ireland. With expectations that financial resources will be further stretched by COVID and austerity measures may return in the longer term to repair public finances, we will need to unlock better value and better social and economic outcomes and address shared global challenges in a sustainable way. On the back of the ICE report, the Independent Ministerial Advisor Panel on Infrastructure was established by Minister Mallon in August of this year, and we're tasked with considering how an infrastructure commission might support more effectively long-term planning and development of relevant infrastructure here in Northern Ireland. The panel is made up of independent members from a range of sectors and experts, and over a six-week period, we consulted with over 100 key infrastructure stakeholders from construction, banking, utilities, investors, and with infrastructure commissioners across the globe. We surveyed stakeholders and held over 40 online consultations with a range of experts, both locally and globally. The evidence demonstrates that there is overwhelming support for an infrastructure commission in Northern Ireland, based on the collective views of over 100 key stakeholders. The Infrastructure Committee is well versed on the issues with large scale capital projects that have been well articulated by not only the Northern Ireland Audit Report in December of last year, but more recently the Public Accounts Committee report on major capital projects. We also note the PAC report have called for an independent body to provide oversight to strategic capital projects, and we feel this is one of the roles a commission could play in Northern Ireland. As part of our six-week consultation process, we investigated the role and value that infrastructure commissions can bring across the globe. And the panel found that infrastructure commissions, commissions are operating successfully across the globe. Our report looks at eight infrastructure commissions from Australia, New Zealand, the National Infrastructure UK, Infrastructure Wales, and Infrastructure Scotland. All but one is independent, and another one is in, as advisory. The objectives of the commissions include improving well-being, equality, opportunity, sustainable economic growth, and encouraging engagement and democracy. The budgets of the commissions range from 1.5 million to 6.6 .6 million, but many are dealing with infrastructure projects in the scale of billions, which often provide another level of insurance, or more importantly, provide investor confidence on project delivery. 
The time horizons of Commission is on average 30 years. And the Commissions have a range of reporting structures, whether that's reporting directly to Treasuries, Ministers and the public. All include hard infrastructure plus energy and digital, and some include housing, education and health. And many have a separate project delivery agency, which would be equivalent to the Strategic Investment Board. So where do we see the gap that a Commission could fill in Northern Ireland? Well, for us, there is quite clearly a gap in that longer term vision setting and infrastructure planning that looks beyond the 10 years remit set by the Strategic Investment Board. Society needs a vision for Northern Ireland that can help deliver infrastructure that facilitates a larger, digitally connected population and achieve net carbon zero by 2050 that looks to the next 30 years. The current systems of one year budgets, political cycles, government plans and existing strategies are by their nature short term in focus. And when we benchmark ourselves against international infrastructure commissions, we can see that they have all aligned to infrastructure vision with infrastructure life cycles and evidence based needs assessments of society. The panel believes that an infrastructure commission for Northern Ireland can provide a permanent structure that looks beyond budgets, political cycles and strategies and supports us in addressing our longer term needs but more importantly, catch up with our competitors in Scotland, England, Ireland, Wales, and beyond. Well, as I previously said, the evidence presented by an informed stakeholder base was overwhelmingly supportive for the establishment of an infrastructure commission in Northern Ireland. If I may, I'd like to paint a picture of the evidence as to why people feel that it is valuable for Northern Ireland. Stakeholders told us that we felt the commission could raise the quality of life and the well-being of citizens. The Commission would maintain independence from government but report directly to the executive. Stakeholders told us that this could help us plan with longer term vision, that 30 year vision, strategic oversight, monitoring and reporting on progress that has been highlighted by the PAC report. It should look at all forms of infrastructure including hard and energy and digital, so beyond the DFI portfolio and more importantly look for synergies across the entire infrastructure landscape. It could help us deliver a step change in our environmental performance to address climate change and meet 2050 net zero targets. It can advise on how speed and efficiency could be increased in planning and procurement processes and apply best practice from commissions across the globe. It can encourage collaboration, engaging relevant stakeholders and communities early in the process with key infrastructure projects. But more importantly, stakeholders told us that they think it could drive economic growth and competitiveness, address our sub-regional imbalances and the rural-urban divide, it can make the most of digital opportunities and more importantly help our digital divide issues. So the recommendations of the independent panel are therefore that we establish an infrastructure commission as soon as practically possible. We believe this will deliver longer term independent infrastructure strategy formulation and decision making. This focus on longer term planning is already in place in Scotland, Ireland, England and in progress in Wales. We face a competitive disadvantage and cannot afford to miss key economic opportunities. It will deliver renewed and relentless focus on what matters in the long term for society, well-being of our communities, climate change, digital opportunities competitiveness and inclusion. It will add internationally respected expertise to the role of the infrastructure commissions and more importantly better use of infrastructure spending, improving value for money and freeing up resources for other projects such as health and education. But it's also about collaborating and learning internationally, east-west, north-south, collaborating internally, bringing parts of government closer together and breaking down those silos. It will be a highly respected, trusted and professional organisation that engages all in society. It can identify and work with stakeholders to identify solutions to bottlenecks, such as planning and procurement, and how we can finance infrastructure investment in the future. We would like to see it charged with all aspects of infrastructure beyond the DFI portfolio, looking for synergies and opportunities to exploit across the entire infrastructure portfolio working with and reporting to the executive, but will have statutory independence to ensure a permanent structure and permanent funding.
We see this as an equivalent to the Office for Budgetary Responsibility for Infrastructure, which will provide independent and authoritative analysis of Northern Ireland infrastructure needs for the next 30 plus years and allow ministers to make better informed decisions. We are convinced by the evidence of over 100 expert stakeholders that an infrastructure commission is the right thing to do for Northern Ireland to achieve a greener and more inclusive society. And at this point, committee, we are very happy to take any questions. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank you very much, Kirsty. And can I just commend you and your team on your report? And I think there are certainly lessons to be learned um, around this place um, with regards to the speed in which you yeah. were able to present this and um, <laughs> the number of people that you were able to engage with. Um, and it is very much commendable. So thank you for that. Um, obviously, this started off um, with the terms of reference, which was sort of limited to um, the remit of the, um, the Minister for Infrastructure. And I suppose yes. it, it's not that it probably was naive or anything else, whenever that was done, that it was obviously going to be much broader than that, um, given the fact that um, so much of what we do here is cross-cutting across <coughs> a number of departments. So at this stage, can you maybe give a, um, a synopsis, perhaps, of the engagement that you've had outside of infrastructure and what and whether or not that has been positive? Yeah. Um, well, I've, as I said, energy and digital came up uh, as an area when we engaged with infrastructure commissions on a global space. All of them were looking at not just the DFI portfolio, that hard infrastructure, but digital and energy. So we did engage with the team in the Department for Economy, uh, head of energy and head of telecoms, and as part of the consultation process, spoke to them about the commission. They seen the value. If, you, if I give you an example of Northern Ireland Water, um, part of the DFI portfolio, but it's one of the largest energy users in Northern Ireland, and yet energy is managed out of Department for Economy. So the, the siloed nature, which kept coming up over and over again, Chair, around how our civil service operated, meant that we were missing those opportunities, those synergies and those connections between what's happening in the digital space and what's happening in, in hard infrastructure. So for us, um, the case was very clear. Um, you know, so, but yeah, I have to say the Department for Economy were very receptive to the idea of the Commission and having that bird's eye view, that holistic view. Um, as you know, we've also engaged with OECD and um, again, they seen this as a very successful model that's been used in primarily Anglo-Saxon countries and, and particularly beneficial. But I think, you know, as we look out the next 20, 30 years, you know, digital in particular is going to play a much more impactful view on, on hard infrastructure. And, and as the previous speaker, uh, right bus and hydrogen, hydrogen, as you can imagine, came up quite a lot. And we feel a commission can provide that independent, thoughtful expert view of what, what is the potential mm -hmm. for hydrogen in Northern Ireland for the next 20, 30 years and give that independent view. Okay, you, you presented a number of international models. Um, for yeah. the Commission, do you have, does the group have a preferred model? I'll maybe bring my colleague Jenny in, Jenny Green from ICE. I'm hoping I'm unmuted, all right. Yes. yes. Okay, that's good. Um, we, having looked at all of the evidence, it's become quite apparent to us that there isn't a one-size-fits-all. Um, and so we haven't called out a repeat this one because we think it's right. We're aware that, you know, in the time frame that we had, there is more work to be done and more consideration to be given. And it certainly wasn't for us as a panel to um, get into that level of detail. We were trying to take that more overview approach of how could this help um, rather than you know getting as far as this is exactly what we believe you should do. Um, having said that, there is best practice that we have lifted out as part of our recommendations from a number of those other bodies and from what's happening um, across the world. Um, one of the key stakeholders we spoke to who gave us quite um, a lot of really good advice and, and offered further support in the future was the Global Infrastructure Hub. So they look at best practice and what's happening right around the world. Um, so that was a really useful tool for us to try to see how you can go about making the decision of what is appropriate here and actually the thing that they said was it is not that there is something you can lift off the shelf and copy that the issues and the challenges we have are unique to here so we will have to work up something that works for here so that's why there's a, there's a table in our report that sets out our recommendations um, in terms of that which does lift best practice from various different ones okay thank you 
And Chair, just to pick up on that, I mean, Jenny spoke about the Global Infrastructure Hub to the point where actually the Global Infrastructure Hub said they would be happy to look at international secondments um, to support Northern Ireland in the establishment of an infrastructure commission. We also got the same support from OECD and Infrastructure New Zealand and Infrastructure UK. So um, I think the one thing that we took away from this is there's so much best practice that we can galvanise and tap into, uh, but we're not doing that currently. And um, uh, there's you know, the support was very well in support there from, from the infrastructure commissions across the globe to help us if we if this is the right thing politically to do for Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you. And I'm conscious of time and other members want to get in, but I have one further question just in relation to um, the barriers that the barriers that there currently are to investment, and obviously we're, we're aware of the issues mm -hmm. around budget, but there's also concerns with regards to our procurement processes and also judicial reviews and the impact that they have. On, on major projects. Can I just ask what engagement you had with procurement and also in relation to JRs, which maybe influenced what um, you were recommending here today? Yeah, I have to say, um, we engage with obviously a range of stakeholders and, and particularly in the investment community as well. And the perception that Northern Ireland has a low bar for judicial reviews kept coming up over and over again. Um, and certainly the issue of procurement was evidenced quite clearly in our, our surveys. Um, we didn't engage with CPD, although we, we were keen to engage. Unfortunately, that just wasn't able to happen. Um, but um, we did engage with the Strategic Investment Board. But we, we certainly engaged with various construction industries. So we, we had a good feel for the issues around procurement. Um, this is something that is an issue that I suppose is experienced by all the infrastructure commissions globally, um, the issues around procurement. And I think that the, the I suppose the contribution a commission can give is that, is that industry expertise, that oversight, that monitoring and looking at best practice. So, but also I think uh, a, a monitoring and, and accountability, but I'll maybe bring in the colleagues on the panel if there's anything in additional wants to say in support of that. Richard. Yeah, in terms of procurement, it was something, uh, procurement and planning both came up quite a lot mm -hmm. in the survey. So um, I'd say in around more than two thirds to three quarters of the responses um, mentioned planning and procurement um, as one of the, the frustrations. And really what the, the responses said was that they, they wanted to see more speed, they wanted to see more efficiency um, and how those decisions were made and how they were taken forward. Um, so it's, it's driven um, to a large extent by those frustrations. But that, um, the breakdown of those responses was across a range of skills and sectors. Um, so that would have come from engineers, from construction companies, from utility companies, from stakeholder groups um, and federations as well. Um, so it was a, a pretty broad um, cohort of the, the 58 survey responses and the 45 consultations that we undertook. Okay, well, that's hugely disappointing that there was an engagement then with CPD given um, the challenges that there are in relation to procurement. Um, mm -hmm. um, I suppose, Chair, it's worth saying there that um, from the point of view of what we had been asked to look at, it was at that sort of um, high level and strategic point of view um, and it, it is obvious that that you know the issues within procurement will they are very complicated um, and so it was beyond the scope of what we could get into detail on for this report but it's also worth just saying for everyone's sake that it's quite obvious that the issues that we have here are not unique to here mm -hmm. issues like this happen yeah. all over the place but that, that feeds into the, the case to be made for taking that strategic view and having that expert body that sits independently that can help shape the strategy of what we are trying to do and where we are trying to get to because you would like to believe that as part of the the outcomes of that you would start to see some improvement in those processes because things are able to have been assessed and thought about at that strategic level first before they then start to move into the pipeline of actual projects that are coming through and being procured. Okay, thank you. Mr Boylan. Thanks, Chair, and thank you very much for your presentation. Very welcome. Just um, a couple of points, because I mean, the, the, the Chair had mentioned that uh, key element, obviously the report has indicated they'd like to see the panel working on an executive level um, in, in your report. In terms of the, the cross-departmental issues, how, how would you see, or what have you learned from all the commissions across the world that you've looked at? How do you see a commission um, pulling all that together? Because most of the things you've mentioned are cross departmental. I've mentioned broadband is a major infrastructure piece, 
but it lies outside the FA <coughs> in this case. So I just want to, and, and also, how would this body be constituted? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Jenny, do you want to pick up the first question and then I can go on to the second question? I will try. It is a big question. Um, so when we've been looking at it, uh, the evidence that we have gathered has been that because it is cross-departmental and actually across pretty much all of the departments that we have here, um, it, it does need to be a body that by whatever mechanism can be made to work does sit in, report to and, and kind of be answerable to and work with the whole of the executive um, simply by the nature and as Kirsty has referenced of the, the silos within departments um, looking for funding within their own departments the nature of this needs to sit at that bird's eye level um, so that's why we've made that recommendation based on the feedback and the evidence that we gathered from others. It tends in, in other jurisdictions it operates in different ways and that's kind of coming back to my previous point that there's not a one size fits all we need to look at what will work here within our um, political and executive structure and, and across the departments by the nature of politics here and um, mm -hmm. so that is something that needs to be thought about we obviously didn't have the the uh, uh, capacity in terms of time or indeed the expertise in terms of understanding how it would work mechanically within the political framework to set out more detail on that one and um, so that would be something for consideration if this is to be taken forward at a later date um, but that that sort of sets out the reasons which i hope covers what you were getting at for why it should be at executive level rather than um, sitting with one particular department in our view and in the view of our stakeholders and then just on the second point around uh we uh, painted back the evidence i mean there was overwhelming support that a that has to be collectively by uh, responsibility by the entire executive but that statutory is really important because we had a similar organization that was in existence in 2004 under direct rule and was stood down in 2006. Uh, so to create that permanency of a structure and permanence of funding I think we felt, and I suppose the stakeholders felt, that the, the right and appropriate mechanism for that was statutory. So providing that permanent structure that will allow us then to attract those internationally renowned experts to be part of the commission and help us drive this forward. So, um, so to give that independence and accountability and drive, but more importantly, I think uh, one of the key pieces of work that a commission can bring is that engagement with with the communities and the general public, which is so instrumental and so valuable. So for example, um, in New Zealand, working with the public around congestion charges, which was very toxic, but bringing people along in that, that journey and also allowing the public to have a voice on what they need from an infrastructure perspective for the next 20, 30 years uh, is really, really valuable and be able to crowdsource solutions, whether that is future, how we fund our future infrastructure needs, maybe NI Water would be an example, um, and how we kind of galvanize and build capacity uh, within the public around the importance of infrastructure and how we make those key decisions was also very important. Yeah, Chair, I'm going to allow this, Chair, go on let okay. other people yeah, Thank you, Mr. Hilditch. Thanks, Chair, and uh, you're very welcome to the committee this morning, folks. Um, there's quite a lot of questions here, but uh, the PAC report is a member of the Public right. Accounts yeah. Committee, uh, obviously quite a damning, damning report there, uh, particularly of the overspends and, and the cumbersome sort of way uh, infrastructure projects go forward here. How much cognizance did you pay to that report or was it helpful or what way did you view, what way did you view the outcome of that report? Yeah, well, we, we did engage with the Northern Ireland Audit Office. I obviously read their report and had a, an online consultation with the Northern Ireland Audit Report. It, it certainly came up over and over again uh, as our various stakeholder engagements, whether that's through surveys or online consultations. So the idea that, um, you know, FTC under utilisation, um, not really leveraging our block grant and not really looking planning long term. But I think more importantly, it was around are we doing enough to attract private sector investment, which if we're talking about green recovery and achieving net zero, will be really, really important for us to be able to galvanize that private sector investment, whether that's renewables or for example, in hydrogen, if that's an opportunity. And if we don't have that confidence from investors that if they invest in Northern Ireland, that A, the projects will have a seamless transition through planning and procurement, 
and then there's you know a potential competitive disadvantage for Northern Ireland in attracting that investment. Um, but I thought that the PAC report was was very welcome, and it certainly aligned with our recommendations. Uh, and certainly, we support the recommendation of that independent oversight body, which we feel the, the Infrastructure Commission could play an active role in that oversight. I think that would be really important. But um, I'll bring in maybe Craig if he wants to. Add to that. Thanks, Kirsty. Morning, everyone. I suppose the only thing I would I would add to what Kirsty said was that um, by the very nature of infrastructure and the survey that we took, it is cross cutting. Mm -hmm. So you know, I was interested in things around climate change and environmental issues, and it came out time and time again with the consultees about that this was something which they feel underpins everything, um, and. You know, I, I think that um, I, I just thought that this was a, re a really important part of the cons consultation process. And it's something which I think in terms of going forward, I think a lot of people said that if we want to have a competitive edge going forward, um, if you're an infrastructure company, for example, you need to know where you're going. You need to know um, uh, about things like climate change and net zero. So the Infrastructure Commission would be a way to set those long term objectives and get the right building blocks in place. Kirsty, could I maybe add to that point as well? Because yeah. one of the other perspectives in this, this discussion is in around VFM, and that's quite rightly what the, the audit office brought out. Yeah. So in this context, you know, a an infrastructure commission that could cost five, six, seven million pounds per annum and potentially help us deliver those billion pound projects much more rapidly and effectively. You know, what you would like to see is that a commission like this could actually more than pay for itself over a period of time as well. So I think that that value for money perspective is also important to, to be cognizant of in that conversation. If yeah. I could come in as well, please, um, just to reinforce some of the points that have just been made. Um, it's obvious from reports that have been coming out that you know that this is not new. There are issues that need to be resolved, and, and I think we can all you know accept and understand that. But there's an opportunity in in setting up a body like this. It, it can be set up as Richard has been talking about in terms of value for money, but it can be set up. And our recommendation is that it is a pretty lean organisation. We've recommended um, a chair and six or seven non-exec commissioners, so it's it's not a huge thing. You know, it's something that is quite streamlined in our vision for it that could therefore be able to to gather evidence. And, and make recommendations fairly swiftly. Um, and I think that it's important to keep remembering that, as Kirsty has said, and the way this tends to operate in other jurisdictions is, is that ability to get the expert advice to consult with stakeholders, um, including the public. Um, and, and that is a way of building confidence here in the decisions that are being made. And it also provides provides a good frame within which you guys as the, the politicians and the decision makers can't make those decisions because you have had that ability to tap into that expertise and that advice and again that was a real theme time and time again in, in yeah. this, the consultations we held was that the key thing to do if this is going to be done and done properly is that the right people are put onto that commission who are doing it for the right reasons and have that real expertise both globally and locally, and, and the experience behind them to be able to, to do this and lift it and run with it. And that is certainly where it seems to work well in other places when they've done it in that way and in that spirit. Okay. Do you have another eight questions? But I know you're a couple of times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, minutes, yeah. I'll cut it and okay. go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Buchanan. Thank you, and thanks, Kirsty, and the panel for that information and that a uh, good report. A uh, we've talked briefly, or some of the other members have referred to the Strategic Investment Board and the CDP. Mm -hmm. Where do you see your uh, the, the commission, should I say, the commission, fitting in mm -hmm. and, and do that? And because CP didn't, didn't, what was the reason, first of all, CPD didn't communicate with you? What was the reason that didn't happen? Um, we, we did ask them to engage um, and for whatever their own reason internally decided not to engage in it. But I think for us, the, the important key stakeholder was the Strategic Investment Board, uh, which we did engage with them and, and had a very uh, productive conversation with them. As I said, Strategic Investment Board is looking for the 10 years is really and the strategy that they're working on now is, is for the next 10 years. Um, and more importantly, in all our jurisdictions, you have the equivalent of an SIB delivery project implementation agency, and then you also have the Infrastructure Commission. So in GB, you'll have the 
major capital projects agency and you have the infrastructure commission so it's not unique that you would have two agencies one looking at 10 years one looking beyond 10 plus really out to 30 years so it's looking at those mega trends um the commission's looking at those mega trends but i also see that the commission will be different from sib and that the commission would be very much engaging with the public and communities and that very external focus but also a front shop window potentially for and you know private sector investment um so sib as predominantly looking at you know public infrastructure spending and how we can leverage our, our block grant whereas I, I think the commission can look at both elements and looking at how we attract that private sector investment but we'll be looking at developing a long-term vision for the next 30 years in northern ireland looking at net zero looking at what's going to happen in, in the digital space and how we can capitalize on those and again we're saying that other areas um like for example scotland and england and the republic of ireland all have that long-term strategy in place wales is currently working on their strategy so we feel that that northern ireland is com at a competitive disadvantage because we don't have that signal to the market around this is where we see the economy going in northern ireland for the next 20 30 years and here's the signals to the market to invest in that so um hopefully that answers your question um, but again i would say sib and the commission will work very close together and certainly when we spoke to sib they seen the value of, of a commission and supporting their work as well so i think mr bowden had touched on it earlier in regard to i think it's somewhere in your in your report regarding vertical and horizontal projects obviously mm -hmm. infrastructure from another sort of we would be generally uh, horizontal but obviously you're into prison schools etc if you're into that do you see it going across mm -hmm. all sectors and <laughs> all departments do you see that with us going jenny i'll bring jenny in with that one <laughs> yeah it's it's fair to say that again this is another one where you know within the, the confines of what we were asked to do we didn't feel that it was right to necessarily start to to get to that level of detail. It's certainly something that is considered to a greater or lesser extent in other areas. Um, so, so, you know, for example, the Commission in Scotland, albeit it has a sort of different um, scope as it's been set up to date um, in terms of its lifespan, um, they really have this focus on including social infrastructure, which would play into some of those horizontal ones, as you say. Um, and yet, you know, the commission that is predominantly covering England, um, it really does stick to the kind of hard infrastructure, albeit rolling out into that kind of digital world as well and, and energy considerations. Um, so it's something that would need to be considered as to what is going to provide the best value here um, and help inform the right decisions. There were mixed views um, across our evidence base on that one, um, and it probably boils down to different people's own perspectives and whatever you know organization they were representing and um, our view was that it, it's something to be considered possibly the way it's phrased in some other places is that they look at the interface between hard infrastructure and those sort of social infrastructure areas and um, which might be an appropriate thing to do here and um, rather than getting um well, for want of a better phrase, sucked into the detail of specifics like that, when actually the, the overall aim for our recommendation for this is that high level strategy. What are we trying to get to? How do we put it in place to make sure that we get there? So it's probably wiser to, to, to not take in too much at the beginning and maybe see how it developed over a period of time and where there was potentially scope to add more value to those decisions. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Kelly. Uh, thanks very much. And thanks, Kirsty and panel members for your work. I found it very informative and probably leading on for both Mr Hilda uh, uh, and Mr Buchanan because I was going to ask about the SIB actually. Uh, I just wondered um, the, the relationship with local councils which also have a fairly mm. significant amount of funding available to them and nobody likes being able to give up the wee bit of power that they have. Yeah. I just wonder how that has been managed you know are the good uh, examples elsewhere and I suppose one of the things uh, uh, from the PSE findings was around um, some of the yeah, you have here about able to recommend an infrastructure investment free of fiscal remit and that is defined as funding guidelines set by government is that born out of some of the frustration um, uh, experienced by many people within uh, the, that area and, and investors um, of, of the restraints uh, by the by government's own procurement uh, procedures 
I'll pick up the first question and um, Richard, if you can pick up the second question. So um, actually, I've just gone blank what the first question was, was there to Laura. It was really about the local councils and the- Yes, the local councils, sorry. Yeah. 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 yeah well, I actually think the commission can be a bridge between what's happening in local councils with the city growth deals and also what's happening at, at an executive level and provide that bridge and um, again look at the opportunities holistically mm -hmm. um, to, to leverage what's happening at a local level and also at an executive level and certainly that is what happens uh, in all our commissions across the globe. Um, it was acknowledged by many of the stakeholders that there is a bit of a gap and you know that local government's doing a lot on these city deals, but are we strategically leveraging that at a at a Northern Ireland executive level? So I, I definitely think that's really really important. And and I think even for local government, that was that was well endorsed as well that a commission could play an active role. And I'll get Richard to pick up on on your second question. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Kirsty. Um, I think in terms of constraints, obviously there are frustrations from a lot of um, individuals that are operating in this arena. So. What they would say is, firstly, that potentially we could get more value out of the expenditure that we have, um, and that's driving more value out of the Dell expenditure and capital Dell that we already have within the block grant. Secondly, it's looking at other sources of funding, so the likes of FTC, which we heard about today through the right mm -hmm. discussion, RRI, and um, other forms of potential charges that might be discussed. So all of those are things that a, the Commission could, could, could consider. In terms of the third point, then it would be about leveraging additional private um, finance mm -hmm. and investment. So across those three um, three things, there are significant um, opportunities and how Northern Ireland could remove some of the constraints on um, public spending and on the amount that we're, we're spending on infrastructure projects across Northern Ireland. So um, hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. I'm being... Could I just, if you wouldn't mind, I know I keep doing that, but I keep saying no problem. A of points to make. Um, <laughs> I think the important thing to say, just to be clear, when we've been looking at this and certainly what we've seen around the world, this is not about anybody being giving up the power that they have. This is about helping inform decisions that are being made by the, the, the publicly elected representatives who are the decision makers. There's no... Uh, so just so that it's, it's really clear, there's no um, request or requirement or... A, or implicit desire for that to be changed. It is just to try to provide that context and to provide the facility to gather this wide evidence base to help inform those decisions. Kirsty, can, can I just come in on the local government point there yeah. as well? Uh -huh. um, I think the local government point is really interesting. Um, one of the key things of local government is to do with how it connects with people how it connects with communities and a key role for the infrastructure commission would be to extend on that so they would really need to be working with local government uh, you know talking with communities talking with members of the public would be a really crucial part of it um, and the other issue i'd say with local government where the infrastructure commission could help is that whenever you have an agency which can take a step back and take a longer term view, you know, a 30 year view, that should really help local government decision making processes as well. So I think it would be it would be a, a, a real winner for local government. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Kirsty. Um, unfortunately, I have four, mem four, four more members who would like to ask some questions, and I've got two minutes to complete this meeting, um, so this could be a challenge. If you're content, um, if members, um, we collate some questions and forward them through to you and your team, um, Absolutely. so we can get um, some more responses in relation to that. So can I thank you all very much um, for attending this morning, and again, huge apologies for how quickly we've had to move through this and it really doesn't give justice to the report that you've presented but hopefully we'll have an opportunity in the future to have um, further engagement. Thank you Chair and thank you Committee for your time and as I said we're very happy to engage with any members on a one-to-one -one basis and, and hopefully you've seen the passion from, from the panel members today um, and uh, we will do what we can to, to build the case for this for Northern Ireland. We feel it's the right thing to do and thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, members, on that basis, are you can I, again yeah, apologies to sure, everybody? No. If you could um, forward 
um, questions through to um, to Ali, and then we yeah. can get them forwarded okay. on to um, to Kirsty and her team for for yeah. further response. So really, then just here, here, can I come in just to briefly? Um, uh, it's not about a question. I'll send them in, but I think picking up on your point about the CPD, we should ascertain as to why the CPD did not engage. Because like yourself, um, I, I really do think that was unacceptable. So we should find out what happened there. Very members content that we do that. Okay, Very thank you. I'm um, just moving then um, forward. Um, there was also an issue raised th that they raised with regards to connectivity, and obviously the UK connecti connectivity review is taking place. Um, and if members are content that perhaps we could reach out to the chair of mm -hmm. that um, mm -hmm. to see, sort of in relation to terms of reference, and perhaps maybe if there's something that we could feed into on that basis, if members are yep. happy to do that. Indeed. Okay, thank you. Forward work programmes at page 188. Members content. There's obviously been a change in the programme for, for next week, and we've included Sustrans and the cycling unit. So mm -hmm. content with that. Um, any other business at this stage? None. Okay. No, no, no. Obviously, remember to maintain your social distancing as you leave the room, and the next meeting um, will take place at 10 a.m. in our, our usual room at the Senate on the 18th of November. So, thank you very much, members. Thank you. It's adjourned. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.